prose should be adorned with the rhythms and numbers of poetry. Marsilio Ficino to the rhetorician Bartolomeo della Fonte. Greetings. You ask, most discriminating Fonte, by whose direction I am principally compelled, or on whose support I mainly rely, when on occasion I weave poetic rhythms and numbers into my prose. So let me give a brief answer to a most prospective man. Heaven commends me, and the heavenly Plato also teaches the same. For if you look up at the heaven, there you see Mercury, both master of eloquence and inventor of the lyre. Were we, therefore, ever allowed to hear him speak? We should frequently hear him mingling the melodies of his lyre with his words, particularly since he is always totally united. The father of serious music, that is, the father of poetry, and with Venus, the mother of a lighter music. If you hear the celestial Plato, you will immediately recognize that his style, as Aristotle says, flows midway between prose and poetry. You recognize that Plato's language, as Quintilian says, rises far above the pedestrian and prosaic, so that our Plato seems inspired not by human genius, but by a Delphic oracle. Indeed, the mixing Indeed, the mixing or tempering of prose and poetry in Plato so delighted Cicero that he declared, If Jupiter wished to speak in a human language, he would speak only in the language of Plato. I might also mention that Moses, Job, Solomon, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, and Ezekiel, and almost all the other Hebrew prophets had given the beauty of their prose with the rhythms of poetry. So did Mercurius, the wisest of the Egyptians, and in Greece, Gorgias, Isocrates, Herodotus, Aristides, and a great many others. Finally, of the Romans, Cicero, in some passages, and Levi, in many, followed the same practice. So did Apuleius, St. Jerome, and the great philosopher Bothius. Clearly, they did this so that Insofar as the language is prose and free of restrictions, it should reach its point more swiftly, and prose often moves with greater freedom and ease, and that, insofar as its poetry has had its number, it should delight, soothe, and enrapture through the blending harmonies and imagery. Assuredly, inasmuch as individual things are born of music, by a natural impulse they are wonderfully enraptured by it. I would rather follow these men hatingly than not follow them at all. Therefore, my friend, you will forgive a Platonist, even if he be inept, and pardon his mixed style of speech. First of all, his very source implanted this in him. Then, continual reading of the poetic Plato nourished it, and, finally, frequent practice with the lyre confirmed it. However, I do not break into poetic strains in some place by chance, but particularly when what underlies the subject or form is poetical. Every note has its corresponding string. All antiquity, indeed, teaches us to combine poetry with philosophy. This was always done, particularly before Aristotle, mainly so that the sacred mysteries of Minerva should be honored and loved by all and should be understood by a few who are indeed pure. We are taught the same thing by the divinity itself, which, rejoicing everywhere in poetic form, adorn the heavens with innumerable lights, as flowers in a meadow, and order the diverse orbits of the spheres so that, in perfect concert, they make a marvelous harmony and melody. Then, in the sublunar regions, the same God, with a similar delight in poetry, arrange discordant forms of things into exquisite concord. Finally, in a variety of ways, he graced the earth, which seemed as though it would be the least beautiful of all creation, with the wonderful shapes and images of minerals and stones, plants and animals, 
He willed the very fruits of the earth to be covered with leaves and decorative flowers. What more? He tempered both the individual and the universal with the numbers of music and measures of poetry.